the one as we are encouraging. Now, as we, as we wrap up the series today, this isn't the last you're going to hear of these, uh, these values. These aren't the last you're going to hear of these words. These are now going to form our language. The idea is that now when we go out, when we're dealing with, the, with each other, when we're rubbing up shoulder to shoulder with somebody else, we're able to ask ourselves the question, is this honoring? Is this being open? Am I being passionate about showing God's heart, not my own opinion? Am I being encouraging and lifting other people up? Because the truth is, whether it's in the house or whether it's out there with people in your everyday life, if we're not doing those things that are honoring and open and and passionate and encouraging, if we're not bringing hope to people, then the truth is we're not being iron that's sharpening iron. We're being used as an instrument to try and blunt iron. That's hard, right? But in your everyday conversations, when you're frustrated and at your tether's end, when you're tired, when you, you've had a, a bad night's sleep or whatever it is and you're coming into conversations with people, it's even in those places we're still called to be open. We're still called to be honoring. We're still called to be demonstrating what God is really like, showing his heart for his people. We're called to encourage and build each other up because iron is supposed to sharpen iron. And if I'm not doing those things, then I'm being used, as Paul says in Hebrews, I'm being used as an instrument for evil when all of my body should be used as an instrument for good. I don't want to blunt somebody. I don't want to tear somebody down. I want to build them up. I want to seek after the gifts that strengthen the church. I want to seek after the things that encourage his people to go and be part of what God has got for them. And that's what this morning's value is. We encourage. We are encouraging. We encourage each other to take hold of all that God has for them. God has more for you more for your neighbor, more for your husband, more for whoever you run up against in your life. He has more for them than just salvation that gets them a ticket into heaven. He's got more in store. You're supposed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You're supposed to see more here, but more than that, you're supposed to have a very full inheritance. You are now joint heirs with Christ. He's got more for you than just that you said the sinner's prayer and now you're saved and now you know him as Lord and that is fantastic. And that is what we want everybody to experience, to have an eternity with him rather than eternity separated from him. We want that. We desire that. But that is just the beginning. I remember when Jordan Jordan and I were dating for four years before we got engaged, another year of engagement, and then we got married. And some could maybe think that, oh, yeah, finally he put a ring on it. Like, finally, he took the hint and he, he married me, right? Best, thing he ever, best decision he ever made. That's what I said. <laughs> you can be tempted to think when you've been doing something for a long time that you get to the wedding day or you get to that promotion or you get to whatever and you think that I made it, this is it, but it's actually just the beginning. Because there is so much more in store for you in that when you step into what God's got for you to take hold of all that is on offer, take hold of all that the cross purchased for you, take hold of all that his blood has covered, restored, redeemed, take hold of the freedom that he has set you free for, take hold of life. He has more in store for you. And we are a people who encourage one another to take hold of all that. We are people who will come up alongside people who maybe have been on this merry-go-round where they seem good for a season and then they just keep going around the same mountain. It's like the Israelites keep circling around and we can be tempted to be like, well, you should know better and we walk away. No, we are people who are going to come alongside them and encourage them that there is, this is great that you've got salvation. This is great that you know the Lord. This is great that you love him. Now let me show you what kind of gift he's got in store for you. Now let me show you what kind of life and freedom and hope he has in store for you because it's not just getting to the wedding day. Now you get to take hold of the marriage. Now you get to, I, I was so excited when we got married, it was, I felt like we got to have a sleepover every night with your best friend. It was fantastic. I remember laying there and thinking for the so long, like our entire honeymoon, for, for like months into our marriage, I remember waking up in the morning and being like, oh, I wasted the opportunity just to like hug you all night because I fell asleep. What a waste. It's like, it was like just beginning because now we were going to experience a greater intimacy and closeness than we were ever experiencing before we got married. It's just the beginning. There's this, in, this enjoyment to take hold of the more. And if we stopped and settled at the place where it was just like what we were doing when we were dating, 
what a waste because marriage has more. If we just got to the place where we get them to salvation and then we go, okay, you're on your own, you found Christ, that's tick one for me, another tally on the board that I I led one to Christ, another one I get to take in the bus to heaven and say, look who I brought to you, Lord. If we stop and say, okay, that's you're on your own now, we've missed the part of take hold to make disciples of all nations because we're meant to encourage them, walk with them, lead them, encourage them to take hold of all that God has in store for us. Because freedom, he set us free. Life and life more abundantly. We touched on last week when we looked at Peter how Jesus didn't just get him back to the place of his first love. Jesus didn't just get him back to the place where you've caught your fish and, you know, you, you were tired, you were struggling, you were doing this all night in your own strength. And I didn't just, he didn't just get him to the place where he got to catch a large fish and now it's like, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, I will make sure I ration this so that I don't run out. No, he brought him to the shore. He, he prepared a meal for him that wasn't based on his own strength. But what did he do? He healed the wounds that were hurting him. Peter was so cut up and distraught about the fact he had denied the living God. He denied the Son. And Jesus brought him back to the place that there was more than just coming to know him as Lord. I want to heal you so that you can walk in strength and fullness. There is more that God has in store for you. We're a kind of people that would go out and we would encourage people to take hold of all that God has for them. Now, I see encouragement come in multiple aspects of how we can encourage somebody. We can encourage someone to keep doing the good thing that they're doing. We can look at people like Kate who just brought a prophetic word and then rushes over to turn on the lights. And we can encourage her that it's not done in vain. We can encourage her that we see what you're doing and it's not wasted. But more than just us, we're giving her the words that say, the Father sees what you're doing and it's not wasted. Your reward is in heaven. You are doing this for things unseen. You're doing this, what the Father sees in secret, he rewards in public. We encourage you to not tire of doing good because what you're doing it makes us marvel. We can encourage people. We can encourage Tim and Susie who are here early every single Sunday morning. They're here every single Thursday night doing prayer meeting. They're here always putting their hand to the plow, always willing to go and do things. When Jordan and I are like, we don't like this anymore, they're willing to go and take it to the tip for us. We don't want this, we want that. They're willing to jump in. We can encourage them to not tire of doing good because I know it can feel weary and I know sometimes you can feel like the burden is too heavy and I know sometimes you can feel like your strength is failing, but God will give you strength. He will renew your strength like the eagles. You will fly, you will soar, you will run and not grow weary, you will walk and not be faint. He will renew you. We can encourage them in the Lord. We can encourage Karen, who is out there doing cafe every Sunday, who is encouraging and coming alongside people, who is calling them and catching up and giving her life and opening her home and discipling young women to follow after God. We can encourage you because you give your heart again and again. And even when you get hurt sometimes, you offer it again to encourage people. And we can encourage you that you would be, you would be poured back into, that you're not pouring out and your gift is not wasted. Like the woman with the alabaster jar, this isn't the place that your gift is wasted this is the perfect place to pour it all out it is worthy on the feet of the king it is worthy to encourage the people around you it is worthy to build them up in the house we can encourage each other to not tire of doing good because at just the right time we'll reap the harvest sorry tissues at the back (laughs) we can encourage somebody who is feeling like giving up all hope we can come alongside somebody. Do you know that your one word of encouragement, your an encouragement in the in the dictionary, it talks about it's giving comfort, it's giving hope, it's giving strength to somebody. That's what our encouragement does. Your encouragement can change the trajectory of somebody's life. Your encouragement can pick them up out of the dirt and tell them, I believe in you. I see something in you. I know you've been cast aside. I know you've had doors shut in your face. I know nobody else has seen it. I know maybe you were spoken over as a child that you wouldn't amount to much, that this is about as good as it was going to get and you should be thankful that you're this far. You should be thankful that I'm not like my parents were to me. You should be thankful for the love that you get. You, You can come alongside these people and you can say, but I see something in you. I call out 
what God has put in you. I call out the greatness in you. And I'm not just inspiring you. I'm not just inspiring you with the feelings to get up and the motivation to go and do the thing. I'm not just giving you this this example in front of you of look what you can do and making you feel the things of like, I want to shoot for the stars now. No, I'm calling out the very thing that was planted in you, knit together in your mother's womb. I'm I'm calling out the image of God from within you. I'm encouraging it out of you because then I can turn a life around. I can, I can actually propel somebody in their calling in God when I would encourage them and say, I believe in you. One word. I can encourage somebody. Barnabas in the Bible, he's known. Barnabas means son of encouragement. His actual name was Joseph, but he was so known for encouraging people that it was the apostles that gave him the nickname Barnabas, son of encouragement. That's how good he was at encouraging. And you think, I've never heard of him. I can guarantee you if he didn't go and do his thing, go and be encouraging even when nobody saw him. Go and be encouraging when it didn't seem like he had center stage. Go and be encouraging when it seemed like other people were doing more work for God's kingdom. Other people were more effective in reaching. I can guarantee you if he didn't go about doing his thing still and still encouraging people, we wouldn't be the church that we are today. Barnabas is the one that when Saul had this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, when he's gone from being, when Saul's gone from being this persecutor of the church who would come and take women, men, and children, and he would execute them for believing in Jesus Christ, then he has this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. It is Barnabas who went and took the time to see that he'd actually changed. It is Barnabas who gave him the time of day to find out his story. It is Barnabas who came and when the apostles shut the door and and Saul saying, I feel called to go. I feel like God's compelled me to go and speak to the Gentiles. I feel God's gone. And the apostles are going, hang on. If we bring you in here, is this just a Trojan horse? Are you coming in just to kill us all, to know where we all actually are hiding, to know the the underground churches and to come and to try and wipe us out? They're saying, no, 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 wisdom's telling me I've got to keep you afar to keep the flock safe. But Barnabas is the one who went and found out that the transformation was real, went and found out that the call of God was potent on his life, and then he took him and said, no, 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 let him in. Let him in the door. Give him an opportunity. It was his encouragement that said, I have seen something in Saul. I have seen what God is doing. I can guarantee that the anointing is on his life. I know that he has had a real encounter with the Son of God that has transformed him like only an encounter with the Son of God can. He took the time and he encouraged him and he called it out to give him a platform. But then Paul wrote half the Bible. If Barnabas hadn't have taken the time to go and encourage and he thought that this gift of encouragement was less important than being someone who got to preach the word or less important than someone who got to go do this or do that, if he didn't take the time to encourage, we wouldn't have had Paul step through and step up and write and, and, and preach to the... He set the new church, right? He, he set the early church. Encouragement should be listed alongside any of the other spiritual disciplines in our walk. Because nothing is as powerful, nothing is as effective in our own or in the people's lives around us than being able to encourage them and call out the giftings, call out the fruit, call out the power, the image of God in another person. Encouragement is powerful. Encouragement encouragement will cause us to let go of some things and to confront some things in other people with brotherly love. We went out for dinner a few weeks ago and Jordan said to me, we're getting all dressed up, and he said to me as he's getting dressed, he said, do I look okay? I said, you look great, baby. You look handsome. He's like, so I don't look like I don't have a mirror or don't have a friend? (laughs) Which I loved. I thought that was hilarious. Because a friend will tell you if something's out of place, right? Right? A friend will tell you if they go, oh, not sure if that's flattering, not sure if that's appropriate. We were talking about beige and then I wore beige today. We are talking about, you know, like when people wear beige pants and you drive past and you go, were they naked? Like, like, a friend will tell you, right? Like, do I have a mirror? Do I have a friend? Can I see it in myself? But more importantly, am I missing something that I'm not seeing in myself? A friend is going to come alongside you and tell you when they see, look, I I see you're still bound by something here. I know you've encountered Jesus. 
I know that you have the love of God in your life. I know that you love him with everything in you. I know. But can I show you, can I encourage you into the more God's got for you? Can I encourage you to let go of the resentment? Can I encourage you to to turn away from that sin? Can I encourage you to step into the fullness that God has for you because he's got more? And I know that the world and and the enemy will come and he'll try and tell you that if you fully commit yourself to God, if you're a living sacrifice for him, if 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 you just say, Lord, here I am, send me, all of me, I'll go then you feel like the enemy is telling you you've got to give up all the fun things, that you're never going to have the enjoyment again, you're never going to have the pleasure again, You never whatever it's going to be, people are going to walk all over you, you're going to be a doormat. But the truth is, you step into his kingdom, he wraps himself around you. You step into his kingdom, you've got a shelter, you've got a refuge, you've got a strength, you've got a hope, you've got a joy surpasses all understanding, you've got peace, you've got the fullness of what God has for you when you step into what he has for you fully. And a friend will come alongside you and encourage you that I know that this feels hard to let go of. I know know that you're struggling here, but can I tell you what I see in you? Can I tell you the greatness I see? Can I tell you that I can see the glimpses of what God's got in store for you in the future? Can I encourage? Because let's be honest, people need our encouragement more than they need our judgment. People need our encouragement more than they need our, come on, pull yourself together. It it is in the Bible when people encounter the goodness of Jesus that they go, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, my filthy lips. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I repent. It is when they've encountered the goodness of the king. It's not when they've encountered judgment. It's not when they've encountered legalism. It's not when they've encountered anything other than he is so good, so merciful, so gracious that he would love me when I am unlovely. It is in those places that we see them cry out, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Isaiah, when he, he sees heaven and he sees the angel come and he, he sees heaven, right? I don't know if you've, you've read through this prophecy of Isaiah, but he says, oh, Lord, I am a, I'm an unclean man of filthy lips. Did he need someone to tell him? Did he need God to come and say, you have been saying that over and over again and it's time you pull yourself in line. You ought to do better, do better, do better. No, it is when he's seen the goodness. It is when he's seen the mercy of God. It's when he's seen the the grace of God that says, I still want to use you when you're still unclean. I still want to use you. I still want to love you. I would send my son for you while you're still an enemy of me. It is that place that then he says, I repent and turns. Our friends don't need us to come alongside them and give them some tough love. I know that is language we seem to like to use in our culture. We've we've got this tall poppy syndrome in Australia where someone gets too tall, we've got to bring them down a size, right? Because we don't want their head to be, I'm doing them a favor. I want them to be able to walk out the door and their head not get stuck on the way through. We think we're doing people a favor. No, you know what? The world cuts people down enough. The world tells them they're not good enough. Enough, And if, if it wasn't other people saying it into them, I can guarantee you there is a voice in their own head that is tearing them down. There is a voice in their own head that is remembering and re- rehearsing and nursing these hurts and these things that people have said against them their entire life. They don't need you to straighten them out and fix them up. They need you to call out the goodness of God. They need you to call out the grace of God. They need you to call out the one whose image they were made in. They need you to call out the the one whose their real life is hidden with him in heavenly places. They need you to call out the goodness and the image of God with them so that they would want to rise up, so that your encouragement would come alongside to those who are willing to give up, ready to give up, and it would give them the courage to get up. You would call out the greatness in them so that they could propel forward in the ministry, they could propel forward in their life, they could go and be an encourager of other people so that it would can continue to domino. They don't need you to straighten them out, they need you to lift them up. Paul says all through the word, so continue to encourage one another. Build each other up. Let us not grow tired or or weary. Let us, what what does he say? He says, let us think of ways to motivate each other to acts of love and good work. I've got to think of ways to motivate you. I'm I'm not condemning you. I'm not coming and telling you, making you feel so guilty that now you're, all you're going to do is curl up in a ball of shame and go back to what you've done before. When you feel condemned, when you feel judged, when you feel like you've, you've missed the mark and someone has pointed it out to you over and over and over again, 
You might be able to stand up and try better for a little bit, but eventually the enemy's going to get in there and you're going to tell yourself, I can't do any better. I've tried and I've tried. What's the point? I'm going back. No, people don't need our strong hand. People need our encouragement. Because if Jesus didn't blow out a flickering candle, if Jesus didn't crush a weaker's reed, why do you think he sent his church to go and slap some people? He's called you to be an encourager. He said that you would be known by your love. We encourage it out of people. I want you to turn to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we've read about one of Jesus' dear friends, Lazarus. And Mary and Martha, his sisters, have sent word to Jesus that your dear friend, they've used this language, right? Your dear friend is sick. And if you don't come, he's going to die. Jesus tells them, he gives them an encouraging word. He says, this will not end in death. No, this has been done for the glory of God. So the Son of God will be given glory through this. He's given them an encouraging word, a promise to hold on to. Should you choose to accept it, this is the promise I'm giving you. This is the word. He ends up staying where he is for two extra days. Then he says to his disciples, let's go, let's go see Lazarus. He's asleep. I've got to wake him up. We know. I always laugh at this part because the disciples say, well, if he's asleep, he'll get better. And he goes, no, he's actually dead. He's not asleep. Like, well, can you blame him for thinking he's asleep? When you said he was asleep, can you blame him for thinking he was asleep? Like, come on. Anyway, Jesus goes... Mary comes running out to him, sorry, Martha comes running out to him first and they have this encounter, this conversation where she says to Jesus, if you had have been here, by this point Lazarus has already died, he's been in the tomb for four days already and Martha says to him, if you had have been here he wouldn't have died but even still I know that whatever you ask of God he will do it. Jesus tries to encourage her again because he's known as the God of all comfort, the God who brings comfort. And the same word there for comfort is the same word that is used for encourage. So he's the God of all encouragement. And he's giving Martha this encouragement that I am the resurrection life. Whoever believes in me will not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe this? They will rise from the dead. Yes, I've always believed that you're the son of God. She goes back to the mourners Mary comes running out and she comes in such a haste that all the mourners take notice and think she's going to the tomb, so they come with her. Jesus sees her coming, sees her wailing. She says the same words that Martha said. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. He looks around and he sees the mourners weeping and wailing around. And he says to them, he gets mad. This is where we see that Jesus wept. This is the, the, all, the infamous, shortest Bible verse ever. Jesus wept. Why is he weeping? He's not weeping just because his friends passed away because he knows that this doesn't end in death. What's he weeping about? He's weeping that he gave them a promise. He gave them a word. He gave them what was coming ahead, but they didn't take hold of all that it was. And so now in the in-between, it's still going to happen. He's still going to resurrect Lazarus, but now in the in-between, they've had this period of, of deep grief. They've gone through this mourning, and as a compassionate, loving God, he, his heart is breaking for them that because you didn't take hold of all that I had, you had extra mourning along the way. You, you went through some things, you felt some things. And I'm not just talking about a bit of sadness because you watched a movie and someone died on the movie. I'm talking about deep grief. And he gets mad and he gets sad because he looks and he says, you could have, you didn't have to have this. You didn't have to carry this mourning. You didn't have to carry this weeping because if you had have taken hold of the promise that I gave you, when I gave you that encouragement that this wouldn't end in death, if you had have actually taken hold of all of that, you could have skipped this and instead gone through this period of him in the tomb, gone through this period of this feels weird, I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm expectant. I'm hopeful. I'm confident in his faithfulness. And instead of having your stomach twisted in knots when you're waiting on things to come to pass and you don't understand, when you've been laid off your job and you don't understand how God could get you to this place, instead of coming and calling the prayer chain and and doing all these things where you just become this, this weeping, sorrowful person in front, instead of you stood up and you go, Lord, man... How, I, don't, I don't understand what you're doing. I, I've never seen this before. But how, how grateful am I that I'm doing it with my provider? 
How grateful am I that I am waking up with you knowing that you're my strength, knowing that you're the one that meets every need. How grateful am I that I'm waking up with you. I don't have to understand the end result. I'm just confident I know who you are and I know what you do for me. I can skip the the stress. I can skip the ulcers in my stomach because I'm so torn up with worry. I can skip the mourning and the whatever it might be when I hold on to the promises that God has. I take a hold of it in full because I know what he has is good. And whilst there is still breath in my lungs, he is not done yet. That is that is our Christian walk. When we come alongside people who we see are struggling and they're they're buried beneath the burden of life, buried beneath the burden of this and that, whatever it might be that they're in turmoil, we can come alongside them and we can say, do you remember when Jesus told you this wouldn't end in death? Do you remember when Jesus gave you this promise that meant that you didn't have to settle down in this pit of despair, that you could rise up above it and know that my God walks on water, my God moves mountains, my God pursues me, my God loves me. Do you know, can you take hold of the truth and the promise? Okay, come alongside and, and, and we know that we read in the word that laughing in the face of someone who is weeping is like, I can't remember the exact analogy, it gives, but it's like vinegar in a wound. Like it, it is painful and it's abrupt and you're supposed to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. But once I've come and I've said I can feel you and I hear you and I see you and I'm sorry, but God still turns all things for good. I'm not coming up with empty flattery. I'm not trying to come up with the right words to someone who's going through a hard season and a hard time. And I'm not discounting the feelings that come with that. But I can come alongside them and I can remind them that let hope live. Hold on to hope. I love in Hebrews 10, it talks about how, I'm not going to turn it because I don't have my glasses on, but he talks about how let us hold firmly to the hope we have attained. Then he goes on to let us motivate each other to acts of love and good works. I find that so interesting. The whole passage is called a call to perseverance. And in the call to perseverance, he says, let's hold tightly to the hope that we have. How do we do that? We motivate each other in acts of love and good works. How do I hold on to hope? How do I keep lifting up my head? How do I keep knowing that everything is going to work out for the glory and the goodness of God? How do I know? How do I keep the promise? Because I know he has said to me, I have plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. I have plans for greatness in your life, the things that I'm going to do for my glory. This is going to give me glory. It doesn't give the king glory if his, if his servants, if, if his loved ones are, are beaten down and, and in slavery. It gives him glory when they see that he can set a nation free. It gives him glory when they can see that they're going through it and yet people look at them and they still have peace. They still have joy. They still hold on to hope. How do we help each other hold on to hope in those hard seasons? How do you help each other when you've got weak hands and tired knees? We motivate each other to acts of love and good works. We come alongside and we encourage one another. We call out the image of God. We remind them of the promises of God. We turn to the word and we offer the words of living life, not just our own empty words of flattery. We encourage one another. We call it out. Jesus then, after getting mad and and sad about their mourning over all of this, he he says, take me to where you buried him. They take him to the tomb. He says, roll away the stone. To which Martha protests, Lord, he's been dead for four days. His body will be decayed. The stench is going to be horrendous. Didn't I tell you? That you would see God's glory if you only believe. So they roll away the stone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus calls out. He thanks God out loud, not for his benefit, but for the people's benefit, that they will know that the Father hears him. And then he says, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And out comes this man, resurrected. Jesus has done the impossible thing, and he has resurrected a dead man and called him out of the grave. But then he says, it it, it goes to the effort of telling us that he is wrapped in grave clothes. Let's, Let's have a look. It says, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. 
Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and his feet bound in grave clothes. His face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Jesus, we've seen, we've witnessed, we've read, he has done the impossible thing that man cannot do. He has resurrected the dead that he would come walking out of that grave, but he is still bound by some grave clothes. He is still bound and wrapped up in some things. And instead of Jesus going and saying, let me fully set you free of this. I've resurrected your life. I've done the impossible thing. Instead of him going and helping him and saying, let me help you with that and unwrapping every bit of grave clothes, he turns to the people with him and says, now you unwrap him and let him go. Why? If God is always after the best thing for us, if he is always after the thing that is intended for his glory, it tells me not that he is impatient, not that he's frustrated, not that he can't be bothered to go and unwrap Lazarus himself. It tells me that there is, it is for our good. It is for our best. It is for our benefit and for his glory. If we would allow the people around us to help us become unbound of what is keeping us from walking in the fullness of what God has done for us. We are bound by some things. I've got some some little colors. God has, he's rescued you from that abusive relationship. He's done the thing that that man couldn't do. He's, He's rescued you out of that home. He's rescued you out of this or that, that trial, that thing you thought was going to crush you, that was going to be the end of you, the death of you. He saved you. You're still here. He's rescued you. He's done what man could not do. He did the impossible thing, but you got so hurt when they were doing that thing. You got so offended when they said that thing. You got so beat up and torn up and cut, and now you started saying to yourself, you know what, I don't need people. I'm never going to let somebody do that to me again. I'm never going to let them hurt me again. I'm never going to let them get closer. I'm not going to have to rely on anybody again. I'm not going to be dependent on anybody again. So what do you do? You set boundaries. You set rules in place of what they're allowed to say to you, of how close they're allowed to get. You set these things in place to protect your heart, to build up a a fence to build up a shield around yourself and what are you actually doing you're preventing them getting close enough to help you unwrap so now you might be walking around and you're resurrected that's fantastic you might have had an encounter with the king and your life is transformed and that's amazing you're alive on the inside he does not revoke what he has done but instead of walking in the fullness of what he has accomplished for you you are walking around wrapped and bound and you can't even fully enjoy what God's got in store you can't fully enjoy what God's done because you're holding on to your hurt you're holding on to that pain You're holding on to that bitterness. You're holding on to that resentment. You're holding on to this and that. You're holding on to that. I know what those kind of people are like. I know what those kind of people, I know what they're really after. And I'm not going to get caught up in it. I'm not going to be deceived. I'm I'm not a fool. You're walking around wrapped up. And if Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days and he's wrapped in these grave clothes, his body already beginning to decay. Those clothes aren't just coming off easy. Those clothes aren't just clean. They're starting to stick to the body that's beginning to decay, the flesh that's starting to tear apart. So Jesus has called Lazarus out of the tomb, but Lazarus is carrying out with him the stench of death, binding him still. You've been called out of that thing. You've been rescued. You've been redeemed. You've been restored. He's done the impossible thing. And yet you wonder why when you walk around bound and with your attitudes and with your heart and with your beliefs and with your preconceived ideas and you wonder why people scrunch up their nose at the stench of death. You need to let people get close enough to come and help you unwrap. Let us. Let us come and help each other. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us strip 
off the things that bind us. Let us strip off the things that weigh us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. Let us be free. I know that they hurt you. I know that it left a scar. I know that you're scared of what people can do. And you know, the truth is, I see through people who seem hard on the outside and I see the softness of the heart on the inside. I see the dead man raised. But you can have a very real encounter with Jesus. You can come and you can be weeping in your repenting of the sin you're turning from. You can come and you can have this very real um, life-changing experience where you have, you've literally been dead back to life. And yet you can still be carrying around attitudes, beliefs, feelings, hurts, nursing, past scenarios in your head that is actually detrimental to what God's wanting to do in the kingdom. Because do you know if dead flesh stays connected to living flesh, the dead flesh jumps across to start decaying the living? Do you know that even though you have been restored and redeemed and you are loved and and God sees everything in you, do you know that your attitudes can still rub off on the person next to you and give them a bad taste for church? We have to unbind but we can't do it by ourselves. I mean, that was a bad illustration. I should have wrapped myself up so tight I needed Jordan to come up here and let's cut me free. There is a reason Jesus turns to the people and says, you unwrap him. Let him go. We are a people who would come alongside and we would encourage each other to take hold of all that God has for them. We would encourage them to turn away from that and have another chance. We would encourage them and say, I believe that there is something in you. Let me help you up. We would call out the image of God in them. We would call out the greatness. We would call out the masterpiece God has made them because we know that they're a child of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, I thank God for you because I know through Jesus Christ you have open and ready access to the grace of God. What does that mean? It means even someone who is down in the dirt, even someone who is bringing it on themselves, even someone who is choosing to go and do, the second that they turn and accept Jesus, the second that they repent of their sin, they have ready and open access to the fullness of the grace, to the fullness of the mercy, to the fullness of the inheritance, because that is how sufficient the grace of Christ is. And we encourage them to that place. We don't reprimand them. We don't come alongside with a harsh word to tell them you've got to straighten out, you've got to fix up, you've got to do this. No, we come alongside and we say, let me help you. Let me help you unwrap because I can see you're bound. Now, our values, they're not an independent checklist. They're not one thing independent of another. They are wrapped together. My encouragement of another person is only as effective as they are open to receive it. But how can I help someone be open if what they're hearing come from my mouth is dishonoring? How can I encourage somebody to be open with me if what they're seeing in my life, the example that I'm setting, isn't the love of the Father, it is legalism, it is religion, it is judgment. How can I encourage them to be open if I'm not being the church that God intended us to be? We are honoring We are open. We are passionate. We are encouraging. We bring hope. Because these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. To finish up, we're going to turn the music on and and pass out the communion. I want to just give you five simple suggestions of how can we encourage other people. Now, I can't take credit for these words. I read this in a book. I thought it was great. Didn't think I could say it any better, so I wrote it down. (laughs) Christian encouragement or depositing godly courage into one another through our words and actions is a command. It may feel awkward or countercultural, but we get better with practice. So here are five suggestions. Number one, turn to the word. You don't need to try craft the right words. Let scripture be your starting point. Share with others where you see the Spirit working in them and through them. 
point out the fruit of the Spirit you see growing in them and affirm them in their spiritual gifting and faithful use of those gifts. Celebrating another's spiritual fruit and gifting is a great start towards true Christian encouragement. We need to celebrate one another. We need to not feel intimidated or like they're excelling means that we're not doing good enough. No, we need to celebrate the giftings. We need to celebrate the fruit in one another's life. Number two, be specific. Our encouragement is most meaningful when we take interest in others and are specific. Be observant. Then based on what you observe, offer examples of how you have seen this person live out their faith. Specific examples bless the hearer and show that you have taken a genuine interest in them. Paul tells us, don't just say you love one another, genuinely love one another. Take an interest in others too. Don't just look out for your own interest. Don't think you're too proud to, or too important to go and help somebody else. He says you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. People are the point. Number three, be intentional. Give thought to who could use encouragement. Spend time intentionally telling them how you see them being used by God specifically. It goes deeper than a simple compliment. The goal is to call out where you see God's image in them. Number four, be selfless. Don't hold back from encouraging someone for fear you'll feed their pride or reduce your own opportunities. Don't let your own insecurities inhibit your encouragement and honoring of others. You can encourage someone for their benefit without flattering them for your own. We have a choice to be selfless or selfish in our encouragement. And number five, be courageous. Don't just encourage godly things already being done, but encourage the pursuit of godly things not yet being done as well. We often need godly courage to pass along godly courage. Find uh, find words to encourage friends toward Christ-likeness. Be gracious rather than legalistic. Use godly courage to confront sin with kindness and gentleness. Few actions are as challenging yet so affirming to our works than encouragement. When we encourage someone, we have the opportunity to speak healing truth into their life. And we do this by grace through a heart changed by Christ. Proverbs 12 verse 18 says, Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. We are an encouraging people. We're a people who's going to come alongside and tell them, I don't think that looks flattering on you. We're going to come alongside them and tell them, I don't think you can see this in yourself. And we, we don't just come with our own words. Like you, I, I want you to go and ask the Holy Spirit for how, the wisdom, the, the, the love to go and confront somebody. Because if the people around Lazarus' tomb came up and saw that his hands were bound and they jumped in and thought that that's bound, I have to cut it off rather than just remove the grave clothes. He would have walked around amputated. We have to have wisdom by how we come alongside somebody and encourage life out of them. We have to love them back to life. Not harsh words. I don't want to cut off the hands to remove the grave clothes. I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We use the Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom and love and allows us to see through his eyes. Ask him. He'll show you. He'll give you strategies that you can't even come up with yourself. So many times we've had times where we're like, okay, we need to we need to talk with this person just to encourage them along. In Maybe they need to grow in this area. Maybe they need to do this. And when you spend the time, rather than rushing in with your opinion, rather than rushing in with your better idea, rather than rushing in with how you think you should do it, if you spend the time praying, often, not always, sometimes we, we have to confront, we have to do whatever, but often the problem will resolve itself because we spent the time in prayer and the Spirit has gone and softened their heart in advance and they've come and said, I want to change this. They've come and pointed out something that we saw in them beforehand. And it wasn't us running in to cut, to change, to remove. Because I love, I love what Paul says. Run with endurance the race set before you. 
often if we're honest, we would come alongside, we would encourage and our words to try and shape and mold somebody is we're trying to conform them to run the race we're called to race, to run. When we're coming alongside to encourage, we're not just conforming them to be more like us. We're not gift projecting, I'm good at this, so you should be good at this too. I do this, why don't you do that? That We're not gift projecting on people. We're encouraging the gifts God has put in them to rise up. We're giving them the courage to step out in faith. We're encouraging them to run their own race. And in the doing so, we're not confused to think we're meant to run their race either. We just encourage each other because one body, many parts. We need each other. Let's stand up to our feet. Lord, no greater encouragement was offered than when you demonstrated your love for us. You demonstrated the worth that you saw in us by giving your body. You're the father of all encouragement. And we take your body remembering. If you see it in us, if we're still breathing, you're not done. And we take that encouragement to walk in the fullness of what you have for us. Open to others to help us. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for your blood that has made us clean, that has washed us white as snow. You told Peter, don't call something unclean that I have made clean. Your blood is for us, but your blood is for our neighbor. And we remember the power of your blood that washes us clean. We remember the power of your love that covers a multitude of sins. We remember the power of your blood that took away the debt and gave us your assets and credited our account. We remember the power of the blood, not just for us, but for our brothers and sisters, who there is ready and open access to the grace of God through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of your blood and we pray before conversations, good, confronting, whatever, we thank you we would remember the power of that blood, that the grace is for them as much as it is for us. In Jesus' name.